Hi, I'm Dr. Boyce Watkins from YourBlackWorld.com. Now, in case you're wondering why you see strange things behind me, it is because I'm in my hometown of Louisville, Kentucky, and I'm actually in the car, and I'm using the Wi-Fi connection at McDonald's, which shows you how I will get it done no matter what it takes. We have the, the history and the legacy of our people says you find a way to make a way, and, and that's what I did. And I found the McDonald's, and I called up my brother, <laughs> Dr. Wilma Leon. How you doing today, brother? I'm doing great, man. I'm doing great. And when you're done with that, go through the drive through and get yourself a cheeseburger. I will. I will. I might get two cheeseburgers. <laughs> yeah, man. You, you know, I, um, I I wanted to talk to you as an expert on black politics. Uh, you know, history. You're you're a professor at Howard University. Uh, but also, by the way, folks, uh, Wilmer has a radio show every Saturday that you should really check out. Uh, Inside the issues with Wilmer Leon on Sirius XM. What's the number again? One twenty-eight. Sirius XM channel 128, The Power. Let me also ask people to uh, go to my Facebook fan page, Dr. Leon's Prescription, Dr. Leon's Prescription at Facebook.com, and like the page and all of that good stuff. There we go. All right. So so make sure you check him out. Uh, and, and I wanted to talk to you, Dr. Leon, because, um, uh, and I'll brief people on this in case they're not aware, but yesterday some of you may have seen that uh, there was a blow-up with Cornell West and Al Sharpton, or actually Cornell West and Melissa Harris-Perry, uh, two scholars uh, that you may know of, uh, where uh, Brother West uh, said some things about Harris-Perry that, you know, uh, were less than flattering. He said that she was a fake and a fraud, uh, in large part because uh, there's a perception that she is, he, as he mentioned, the darling of the white liberal establishment, and um, and is kind of using that leverage with the Obama administration to kind of leave black people on the back burner. Well, uh, Reverend Sharpton uh, came back and uh, defended Perry. I don't know why Perry herself didn't speak up, but he came back and uh, and actually he he mentioned me in the article as well because I had actually said that I think there's some validity to what Cornell is saying because I think that what's unfortunate is that in many cases rather than focusing on the issue, we choose to kill the messenger because if if you kill the messenger, you don't have to deal with the message. The message is poverty, racial inequality, mass incarceration. That's where it stops for me. Uh, so if you want to say, well, well, none of this matters because Cornell West is mad over inauguration tickets. No, that's not the issue. The inauguration tickets are not the issue. It's poverty, racial inequality, and mass incarceration. So Reverend Sharpton came back, and, and this is where I want to ask you your take on some of this, Dr. Leon. Reverend Sharpton came back and said, well, uh, people criticize me for having access to the president, and if you look throughout history, civil rights leaders, uh, A. Philip Randolph, Frederick Douglass, Martin Luther King, and others have had access to the president, so that does not... Uh, that does not in any way, or so, so my access does not invalidate my, uh, my position as a civil rights leader. So I want to ask you about that issue in particular, Dr. Leon, as well as any other thoughts that may come to mind. Well, I, I'm, I'm going to stay right now, stay away from the uh, Cornell Melissa, Melissa Harris Perry issue. Um, I think that's, that's very unfortunate. Uh, it's time for that dialogue to, to cease. And it's time to really focus on what the issues are in providing uh, constructive, uh, uh, accurate analysis of the issues as it relates to the as they relate to the African American community. Um, in terms of uh, in terms of Reverend Sharpton uh, um, as a civil rights leader, he is that, and God bless him for doing so. He has committed his life to the struggle, and should be commended for that. But to now say that. His relationship with the Obama administration is, com is comparable to Frederick Douglass and his relationship with Abraham Lincoln or A. Philip Randolph and his relationship with President Roosevelt or Dr. King and his relationships with Presidents Kennedy and, jo Kennedy and Johnson. That, to me, uh, is, is a bit of a stretch, to say the least. And here is why. Um, Dr. King wrote in his letter from, from the Birmingham jail, he wrote that there needed to be nonviolent gadflies who would galvanize the community and push the community and the leadership in the country to do what was right by the people. Frederick Douglass was that nonviolent non -violent gadfly for Abraham Lincoln, but Frederick Douglass criticized Abraham Lincoln and pushed Abraham Lincoln to do the things that needed to be done 
as to do the right things by those enslaved Africans in America. In fact, Frederick Douglass wrote in 1864, he said, I, like many other radical men, freely criticized in private and in public the actions and utterances of Mr. Lincoln and withheld support from him. And, and now, of course, Douglas went on to support Lincoln, but he was making it very clear that it was through his and others' criticism and the withholding of support that moved Lincoln to the positions that Lincoln needed to move to. It was A. Philip Randolph having dinner in 1941, I think it was, with President Roosevelt and telling Roosevelt what his perceptions and perspectives were on civil rights in this country that prompted Roosevelt to say, uh, uh, Mr. Randolph, I agree with you. And I agree with you particularly about my power with the bully pulpit. Mr. Randolph, I need you to go out and make me do it. Dr. King continuously challenged Kennedy and Johnson to do the right thing as it related to civil rights legislation. Because remember, especially the Kennedy boys, Early on in the Civil Rights Movement, they were against the Freedom Riders. And, you know, and, and, the, and the other kind of tactics that the SCLC and SNCC and others were engaged in. So uh, it was only through, um, only through um, Reverend um, King and others, you know, pushing. The, John, the Kennedy administration and the Johnson administration. So my question, if, if Reverend Sharpton wants to equate his position with those of Douglas and Randolph and King, then where, is, where has he been pushing the Obama administration for the public option? Where has he been pushing the Obama administration as it relates to, to closing Guantanamo Bay? Where has, uh, where has Reverend Sharpton been in terms of challenging President Obama and Section 1021 of the, of the 2012 uh, um, Defense Authorization Act that allows for the indefinite detention of American citizens? Where has Reverend Sharpton been publicly in pushing the president to give targeted, targeted, urban unemployment relief and job training as called for by Congresswoman Maxine Waters and Congressman Conyers. See, I haven't heard Reverend Sharpton out there publicly pushing for these things. What I have heard is his carrying the buckets of Kool-Aid into the black community trying to get people to be quiet and not challenge the administration not forcing President Obama to go out and do the things that he promised he would do. So that's okay. that's where I see the difference. So so you you you're saying and 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 I I like to hear your perspective because you you're not you you you, you take the space that I think a lot of us should should take. You you're not a you're not a, 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 a um, you're not anti Obama, you're not pro Obama. You just call it as you see it and you're an expert on political science. You under you've taught classes on the presidency so you understand what uh you know what defines reasonable versus unreasonable expectations. So so in your perspective you're saying that the, the the difference between Sharpton versus other uh, civil rights leaders throughout history and their relationships is that in those cases you had individuals that were working for the people and bringing the message of the people to the president, whereas you feel in this case Sharpton is working for the president, bringing the message of the president to the people, and, and almost as a salesperson. Uh, and, and it's interesting because when you talk about Absolutely that, I, right. you know, I, I think that one area where Rev uh, definitely probably should have rethought his position was when he said, I will never criticize Obama. Uh, you know, right there, you're saying I am part. I'm, I'm an extension of the Obama administration, and I, I think that you know he probably could have done a better job by sort of saying, "Look, you let me into the, into the White House, and you you know you've given me this access." But you know, as Malcolm always said, Malcolm always said, you know, no matter how you treat me, 
it, that does not matter. What matters to me is how you treat my people. If you res give me all the respect in the world and you disrespect my people, then you're not respecting me. And I think that uh, at the end of the day, here, here's my bottom line. And this is me with all complete respect for Rev. And I talked to Cornell West yesterday. I respect both of these guys so much. Um, but my position with Rev is e it's easy to remember. We all know Sharpton's famous for his perm. It's the smoothest, coolest perm I ever saw in my life. Well, you know what? Perm is spelled P-E-R-M. When you bring stuff to me that has to do with Obama and politics and Melissa Harris Perry and, and the Democrats and all that, I'm going to ask you about the perm. The perm is poverty, educational equality, racial equality, and mass incarceration. If you cannot talk about the perm, then I don't want to hear what you got to say. That means that, that, that the goal at this point, in my opinion, and this is me declaring a ceasefire, now because, you know, we all, we all get personal sometimes. And, and I'm going to tell you, I don't like Melissa Harris Perry's position that much because I feel like she's a little bit of an elitist. I, I, and, and other people have said that. It's not just me. Um, and I see this a lot in academia. I see academicians who are well paid, you know, in their Ivy League, you know, offices who don't give a damn about poor people. Who don't care about mass incarceration. So my my issue is this. Look, I don't care. Melissa, you making that big money with MSNBC, go take that job and, and God bless you. Sharpton, you're making money for MSNBC, good for you. You, uh, you, you I'm sure you're going to be a great employee for them, whatever it is that you do. But at the end of the day, when you come to me, if you want my vote, you better talk about the perm. That's poverty, educational equality, uh, uh, racial equality. And mass incarceration. If you can't talk about those things, then I don't want to hear anything you got to say. Well, to your earlier point, I am not a political operative. I am a political scientist. And I have to look at the data and I have to understand and assess the policy. And so when I ask the question about the public option, well, but let, me, let me say this. What I said about the public option, what I said about Guantanamo Bay, what I said about the about uh, Section 1021 of the 2012 Defense Authorization Act, I'm not making this stuff up. And I'm not comparing President Obama to some abstract standard. I'm comparing President Obama to President Obama. He was the one who said he would not sign health care reform without a public option. He was the one who said he would close Guantanamo Bay. He was the one who initially said he would not sign the 2012 Defense, Auth Defense Authorization Act if there was language in it that allowed for the indefinite detention of American citizens, which, by the way, validates habeas corpus, which is one of our most fundamental civil liberties that the Constitution guarantees. Those were his promises to us. And in a representative democracy, it is incumbent upon the citizenry to hold their elected officials accountable, not only for what they say, but for what they do. So now I go back to, again, God bless Reverend Sharpton. He does great, incredible work. But on this point, where he wants to compare himself to Frederick Douglass, A. Philip Randolph, and Dr. King, to your point, and you very clearly uh, stated it, it's not about bringing the administration's message to the people. It's not about carrying that bucket of Kool-Aid to the black community and getting people to drink it. It's about are you championing, are you that nonviolent gadfly that Dr. King wrote about in his letter from the Birmingham jail? And to that point, Reverend Sharpton, with all due respect, I got to say no. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think that, um, you know, I, I think Rev is, is wrong on this one. I, I think that he, I, he has to be reminded that you can't just compare yourself to Dr. King just because you want to be Dr. King, just because he was a pastor and you were a pastor. You have to understand there was a sacrifice to, uh, to being Dr. King. Dr. King, uh, on the day he died, was not accepted into the establishment because of his principles. You can't sort of get intoxicated by having access to power and, 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 and powerful and important people, uh, you know, and, and sort of let that deviate or cause And be you afraid, I'm sorry to cut you off, mm -hmm. and be afraid to jeopardize that access by calling 
things out as they are. And Absolutely. that, to me, is where we're falling short. Right. We, as Roosevelt said to A. Philip Randolph, Roosevelt said, I know I have the power of the bully pulpit. Go out and make me do it. And so when you're listening to Reverend Sharpton, when you're listening to Tom Joyner, when you're listening to Steve Harvey, and they're telling the black community that to challenge this president is uh, being a traitor. You're being a Tom, which, by the way, is an insult to Uncle Tom, if anybody ever read Uncle Tom's Cabin. Um, you know, to try and stifle dissent is anti-democratic, and that has never been what has enabled the African-American community to move forward to the degree that it has. And why we should sit back and be silent now, simply because we have an African-American president when Dr. King never said, you know, it wasn't about the president, it was about the policy. And that's where we have lost focus. We have lost focus, we have focused on the president and lost sight of the policy. What's so interesting is that, um, you know, I, I think that we confuse the fact that the Democratic agenda is not always the black agenda. And I think that, you know, when you talk about those issues, the perm, remember, <laughs> remember poverty, right. educational inequality, racial inequality and mass incarceration, uh, you know, really those issues haven't been on the table, except for I, we have to give Obama credit for the fact that he is working to uh, get rid of no child left behind. So the, in the education mm -hmm. area, he deserves some credit. But when you talk about racial inequality, uh, President Obama, I think. Is an interesting president because he almost feels that he's wearing his loyalty to the to the black community on his skin. He doesn't have to actually show it through action. Other presidents can't say, "Hey, look, I'm a black guy, so you know I'm down for the cause." No, they had to actually show us that they were committed. Obama said, "Hey, look, 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 I've got the black card, so you should trust me." And I and I don't think that makes a lot of sense. Also, when you talk about those issues, you know, poverty and racial inequality and mass incarceration in particular. Those issues haven't been discussed. Nobody has had any conversation about this. And I think that you know, f for the black community, we, we've just got to realize that um, if politicians aren't representing our interests, we have to really reconsider how, how we vote. But what's, what's also interesting to me, though, Dr. Leon, is that it seems to me that, that we have to accept one fundamental reality, that not every black person cares about poor black people. You know, we're just like white folks. White folks, you know, you got rich white folks who are educated, who are doing well, who don't give a damn about poor white folks. So we can't expect black folks who are, you know, sitting up in their, you know, with, with their with their jobs and their education and all this other stuff to care about people who are in prison or people who are in poverty, et cetera. So I think that, the, you know, when we talk about the black agenda, we have to realize that the Obama presidency, um, to some extent, it was a huge advance for, for the black community, but in, in other ways, it added to the division of the community, almost the same way, um, almost the same way integration was a mixed blessing for us, right? It allowed some of us to elevate, and, and, and it, but it also uh, diffused our power as a community. I think the Obama presidency, especially when they're playing black leaders, uh, you know, against each other like this, has really caused a huge divide and conquer in our community. And I don't know if we're ever going to recover. I'll let you get the last word. Well, I think it, I think it's important to understand that. We weren't always Democrats, that for a number of years we were Republicans because it was the party of Lincoln. It was in the 1940s as a result of African Americans starting to get access to Roosevelt's New Deal programs that I think it was the editor of the Pittsburgh Courier who said early in the 40s, our debt to the Republican Party has been paid and it's time now to turn Lincoln's picture to the wall. That started the migration from the Republican Party to the Democratic Party. And again, as we uh, gained access to New Deal programs, as uh, President Roosevelt signed the, uh, uh, the executive order uh, prohibiting discrimination in the defense industries and in government employment, that then brought us into the, into the Democratic Party. Then, of course, in the late 50s and the 60s, it was the Civil Rights Movement. But understand, in each of those instances, it was policy, not personality, policy. And I say again, if we focus on the personality and lose sight of the policy, 
we are becoming totally confused. So, uh, I'm you know, so you know what that means, folks? That means that um, even if he can sing Al Green and, and sing it well, which he can, that doesn't mean that you shouldn't pay attention to the policy. And you're right. I think that if you ask most people, why are you going to vote for Obama in 2012, they don't have an answer for you. Their answer is simple. Oh, I, because I like him. Well, why do you like him? What policy has he supported that has helped you in your life? They can't answer that question. They just like him. And, what and are I you think, getting for your vote? Right. So, so the what end of the day. What are you getting for your vote? There you go. So at the end of the day, folks, I, I want to make it very clear that I'm not demonizing those who support President Obama, who love him. I'm certainly not demonizing those who support Reverend Al Sharpton. Um, I, I love, I respect the brother a great deal myself. Um, I think that the bottom line is that we have to stop the fighting and going back and forth and focus on the issues. Remember, it's all about the perm. That is poverty, educational equality, racial inequality, and mass incarceration. If politicians can't come to the table talking about those issues, then I don't think they deserve the black vote. So thank you so much for checking us out at yourblackworld.com. This is Dr. Wilmer Leon from Howard University and also from the show Inside the Issues with, with Wilmer Leon on Sirius XM 1. Channel 128. 128, The Power. And uh, I'm Dr. Boyd. And go to Dr. Leon's prescription at Facebook.com. There you go. All right. So until, right. We meet, until we meet again, stay strong, be blessed, and be educated. We are gone. Peace.